Hello, good people. It is Todd Shannon, data scientist, social commentator, getter of the buckets. And today, what are we talking about? Uh, we are talking about the most epic takedown I've seen in a long time. One, Jason Whitlock takes down who I like to call, who I've now coined, Stephen A. Grift. Grifters going to grift, as they say. Grifters keep on grifting. Time keeps slipping. I think I'm going to basically transform that song to Stephen A. keeps grifting, grifting into the future. Anyway, uh, you didn't come here to hear me sing. Let's talk about what this is about. Now, if you haven't heard, basically, uh, Jason Whitlock did a kind of a long, almost investigative journey, I would say, kind of a little investigative journalism after reading Stephen A. Smith's memoir and noticing several inconsistencies in Stephen A. Smith's story about his alleged college basketball participation. Now, as a person who played Division I college basketball, I am offended. I personally take offense to someone. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if you, I guess if you wore uh, a, a military uniform or a police uniform and you have someone impersonating an officer, I feel like Stephen A. Smith is impersonating a college basketball player. But we'll get back to that. The thing that I want to expose about Stephen A., and if you watch my channel at any length, you've known that one of the major themes that I have covered in the past is this idea uh, how the left loves black women, right? And the reason why the left loves black women is because black women are a, an excellent tool to deliver nonsense, idiotic leftist ideas because black people uh, and black women are, are perceived to be on the bottom of the totem pole with respect to the power hierarchy, right? So anytime a black woman says something that is stupid and clearly false or clearly uh, something that is not tenable, for our nation or for our culture, what have you, and someone comes out and criticizes that opinion, they can immediately say, well, you just criticizing because I'm a black woman, because I'm a blah, 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 right? And don't let them be a gay black woman, because that's like the, the trifecta of, of you, know, uh, you know, the oppression Olympics, right? They're at the bottom, therefore they're at the top of the oppression Olympics. So a gay black female can say any stupid nonsensical thing that they absolutely want, and nobody can respond to it because if you do, you are, quote, punching down, right? So this is the strategy of the left. But I do want to say it is not limited to the black female, right? If, 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 you're, if you have any sort of uh, oppression status, right, if you're black, if you're gay, if you are black and gay, you can be a male, not quite as powerful as the female, right, as the female version of it, but Still, anything's better than a straight white Christian male, right? So any, anything outside of that, you, you, you have some, uh, some cred with respect to your oppression status. Now, Stephen A. Grift has leaned into this full stop. And the reason why I believe he has done that is because he wants to be the face of what I call ES Pretend, right? Not ESPN, ES Pretend. ES Pretend is a fraudulent network has become a cesspool of woke ideology and just, you know, things that, you know, ideas that we don't want our kids and our, and the next generation uh, ingesting or carrying forward. But that is what it is, right? It's a, it's basically a grotesque creature, a diseased animal, a diseased mouse that is Disney. And ESPN is an extension of that being that they are a part of the Disney family. ESP, uh, Stephen A. Smith wants to be the face of ESPN. And how can you be the face of ESPN with this diseased ideology if you don't play ball, right? If you don't echo those ideologies. And Stephen A. Smith, what I've noticed about him over time is that there was a time where I felt like if Stephen A. said anything that was overtly or even remotely political, he was saying things that for the most part were based, right? Stephen A. Smith has said he's an independent. He's never said he's a Democrat. But back in the day, when he was saying things, he was saying things that, in my opinion, were pretty much more right of center. And so I want to give you an example of this, something that he did uh, several years ago when he was on CNN. It's probably eight years ago. Stephen A. said that every black person in America should vote Republican for at least one election. Stephen A. Smith is joining me now. Stephen, who are you trying to send a message to? Republicans, Democrats, African-Americans, all of the above? 
I'd go with all of the above. That sounds about right. But specifically the Democratic Party from the standpoint that I definitely believe that the black vote has been taken for granted. And I, I primarily the black community is, is at fault in my estimation in that regard, simply because on one hand, we're giving one party our vote because they've successfully gone about the business of convincing our community that the other party, the Republican Party, is completely against the interest of the black community. And as a result, we've been very transparent in our support. We've boarded hook, hook, line, and sinker. We look at the Republican Party. I'm not talking about every single one of us, of course, but vast majority of black Americans look at the Republican Party as the enemy. We look at the Democratic Party, even tacitly, as our support base. And as a result, we are very transparent in our support for them. So because of it, they have a license to take us for granted. The Republican Party has a, light to, uh, a license to summarily dismiss us because they believe they'll never get our vote anyway. And then we end up finding ourselves devoid of any kind of representation whatsoever because nobody is really competing to garner our vote and our support. So I said what I said because I wanted folks in my community to stand up and recognize that if you go to a house or you go buy a car or whatever the case may be, you don't just see something you want and say, I want that. Tell me what the price is and I'll pay for it. Somebody has to flatter you. All right, so you get the point. You see D. Stephen A. Smith saying things that I would consider, you know, semi-based. There's another clip of him uh, basically responding to uh, the late Jim Brown where he tried to uh, criticize. I think it was Kobe Bryant. You could probably find this clip. I won't play it here. But basically he was trying to, Jim Brown basically uh, criticizing any black person that says they're conservative. And Stephen A. Smith coming to their defense. So, this was, you know, we're talking about eight, 10 years ago, Stephen A. Smith would consistently say things that were based, that would get an amen for anyone that was right of center. But now, Stephen A. Smith has got his eyes on the, the top spot at ESPN. He wants to be the highest paid person at ESPN. He wants to be the face of ESPN because basically that's what that is when you're the highest paid person for the most part. That's what he wants. And so now he's drinking the Kool-Aid. And what kind of tipped me off to this is that I saw a clip, and I won't play it here, but Stephen A. Smith basically saying that the, the laws in Texas, the laws in Texas that are stopping people from crossing the border are, are, are overtly racist and all of this nonsense. And that, that's what kind of got me on this journey of saying, what's Stephen A. Smith on these days, right? He's grifting. But Jason Whitlock, I think, blew the doors off and kind of showed you who Stephen A. Smith is. Stephen A. Smith is going to do whatever he needs to do in order to bolster his personality, his profile, because he is basically out for the money. That's my opinion. You know, I understand that that's my opinion. I know some people might uh, disagree with that, but this, but the reason why I'm going back to show you these early clips of Stephen A is because I want you to see that I think if you're paying attention, there has been a shift in the way he talks about anything overtly political in the last few days or in the last few years. And especially, this is the key to kind of where I think I to saw the total crossover. Whenever you hear a black person who is criticized, the first thing they grab for in rebuttal to that criticism is that as a black person, whenever you hear them say that first, you know that A, they don't have a sound defense because you don't need the race card if you can defend yourself without it. And secondly, you know that they have bought into the Kool-Aid. They're basically, uh, this is like the, 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 the dinner bell for Pavlov's dog. Any nut job leftist, and sorry for my harsh words, any leftist that has bought into the woke ideology is going to immediately just, the brain just totally just goes into, uh, you know, complete shutdown basically ingesting all of this leftist nonsense and basically just saying, oh, yes, ra it's racial, it's racial. So you don't really need to make any other arguments when you bring in the race card, when you appeal to the oppression narrative. So let's look at Jason Whitlock and how he uncovers the fraud that is Stephen A. Smith's memoir. Let's look at him talk about how Stephen A. Smith has had multiple, multiple conflicting accounts on his supposed college basketball career. 
show you all a little something. I got a little something to show you here. Before we dig into the NBA, take a look at this blind resume here. It's three players, their scoring average in each <laughs> person's final college season. Do we, do we have any guesses who this might be? <laughs> Jalen, who do you think? What, what is this? Nah, this is hilarious. JJ's ah! on the right. <laughs> <laughs> it's our starting lineup from tonight. Well, they're not telling what, they, what they're not telling us I only played one game because I cracked my kneecap in half, but that's neither here. Nor that is neither <laughs> here nor so, <laughs> Jason Whitlock is going to address this here. I, I, I won't play his response here. I encourage you, by the way, to go watch the entire video of Whitlock's uh, takedown. I, I think I'll put the link in the description there. But he's like, yeah, I only played one game because I cracked my kneecap in half. Now, I just got to say this. As a dude that uh, I, I can recall when I was a, a kid, and, and whenever kids were lying, they had a, they always had a certain little catchphrase that they would use that would uh, that would basically tip you off that they were they were being a little bit too descriptive. Why every time Stephen A. refers to this kneecap issue, he says I cracked my kneecap in half. Not not exactly a medical diagnosis. Like what is that? Uh, I crack I cracked my kneecap in half. Like what? Th- that's such a that's such a weird way to say it. Anyway, that's just my suspicions creeping in. But uh, Jason Whitlock uh, points out uh, aptly points out that you can't average you can't score one and a half points in a single game. So how did you average one and a half points if you only played one game? Like that doesn't make sense. You had to play at least you know two games and have scored a total of three points. So that doesn't make uh, any sense. And so he points that out. Now, then he's going to show Stephen A. Smith contradicting himself and saying that he didn't play two games or he didn't play one game. He didn't. He played no games. So we'll have a quick look at that. Let's get the basketball stuff out of the way. I'm sick and tired of people lying about my basketball resume. No, Stephen A., we're sick of you lying about your basketball resume, which is obvious. Ladies and gentlemen, when I say that I wasn't great, I'm talking about compared to greatness. I was good enough to get a basketball scholarship. I was good enough to get my education paid for. With two bad knees. They learn, talk about, I averaged one and a half points a game. They, I saw some article on social media. That's a lie. It was less. See that? You didn't know I was going to say that, did you? It was less than that. It's a lie. How about zero? Because I never played. Because I cracked my kneecap in half. <laughs> there he goes with the, with the, I cracked my kneecap in half nonsense. Okay. He says it's a lie. Well, he's right about that. But the question is, who's telling the lie? I mean, they put that on ESPN. One and a half points a game. He played zero. Well, apparently he didn't want to out himself on ESPN when they showed that graphic. He said, oh, I only played one game because I cracked my kneecap in half. He didn't even realize. He couldn't come up with a lie quick enough to really justify what he had said. He, he didn't realize I had to say I played at least two games in order to average one and a half points, but he didn't catch it there. Now he's saying, well, I, it was even less. I, I, I played no games. Well, which is it, Stephen A.? Which is it? Now, I'm a, I won't play it here, but it, it goes into more detail because he tells this ridiculous story in his book. And there again, I encourage you to go watch it. He tells this rest- ridiculous story in his book and how he got a scholarship at Winston-Salem State because he played a one-on-one matchup with one of the guys that was on the team, one of the better play- players on the team, and they gave him a scholarship because he hit 17 threes in a row, and they gave him a scholarship on the spot. Now, let me... <laughs> guys, I cannot express to you how absurd... How absurd that story is. There again, I played Division I college basketball. Now, he's saying Winston-Salem State is Division II, but like you've, if you play college basketball at any level, they're going to need to see you play in a game context a lot. 
against good competition. Five on five basketball. They don't give out scholarships for you hitting, quote, 17 threes in a row with no defense. They don't do that. It's a lie. That'd be like somebody saying, hey, I got a scholarship to play Division II college football because, you know, somebody saw me throwing my brother in the backyard and I was throwing these bombs. Nobody cares what you can do in the backyard, bro. Let's do it with a helmet with a dude coming off the edge that's going to crush you if you don't get rid of quick enough. Now let me see how you throw it. The idea that in the 1980s they didn't understand this. And then he says that this happened in February, supposedly, outdoors in New York City where it's bitter cold. And by the way, the college basketball season is still ongoing. So he's saying that this guy that went to Winston-Salem State from New York City, he was playing in one-on-one in the park, and that's how he got their attention. It's, I mean, I, I might be butchering some of the details here. Go watch Jason Whitlock's account. But it's absurd. All right. So with that being established, then Jason Whitlock is addressed by Stephen A. Smith on his podcast. And the whole thing, uh, I, I'm, this, is, this is to me is the smoking gun. Because if somebody asks you, hey, man, if somebody says, you, I saw you stealing. I saw you in the store stealing something. Or I saw you cheating on your wife. And the first response out of your mouth is, don't, th- this is a terrible human being. This person is terrible. This person saying this about me, he's, he's a bad person. Why would that be the first thing out of your mouth? Why wouldn't the first thing be, no, that's, that's not true, because this is where I was and this is what I was doing. Let's, let's listen to Stephen A., uh, you know, st- a.k.a. Stephen A. Grift. Ladies and gentlemen, as a black man. There it is. <laughs> as a black man, that's the first thing he goes to. Let me uh, let me activate. Kind of like, uh, have you ever seen uh, um, uh, the Avengers, right? There was this, you know, there was this whole, Hydra had this whole program. That's how they controlled the Winter Soldier. And they would go, mission reporting, and he would they would recite this series of lines that would basically turn uh, the winter soldier into a mindless killer. That's what these phrases do to leftists who buy into woke ideology. When you say, as a black man, they go, oh no, oh, not oh no, but oh yes, he's about to, he's about to put down the gospel of oppression, right? And then everything he, he says from, on, from there on uh, is right and shields him from any criticism. As a black man, all right, let's continue. I often told y'all, I cannot imagine as a black man, knowing our history. For, uh, he he, he should have, he should have thrown 400 years of slavery and oppression. Anything worse than a white supremacist. I can think of several. You know, a pedophile, a murderer, uh, you know, a person who um, uh, would, uh, you know, maybe even someone who abandons his children. You know, those I would put higher on the hierarchy of evil people than, you know, a supposed white supremacist. Okay, but whatever. That is until Jason Whitlock came along. Oh. He's worse than them. He is the worst, most despicable, lying, no good, fat ass human being I have ever known in my life. So. I'm worse than a white supremacist. And all it took for Stephen A. Smith. To reveal this to his audience was for me to review his book. Think about that. Stephen A. Smith declares Jason Whitlock the worst person ever for pointing out clear discrepancies and inconsistencies in his account of his college basketball career. Therefore, he's worse than a white supremacist. 
I'm telling you, man, you can't, you cannot make this stuff up. You can't make it up. You can't make it up. How is it possible that Jason Whitlock, let's just think about the logic, right? Right. This, this is why I say Stephen A. Grift has become a, a swamp creature. He's become a creature of the Disney uh, disease thinking. It's because in his mind, and I think he probably believes this, if, if you see a black man exposing and knocking down the credibility of another black man, right? That's, that's the worst thing you can do, even if it's true, because, you know, as black people, we got to stick together. By the way, I've been thinking about doing a video here uh, shortly about the, the, the so-called black community and how it is and has always been artificial. There's no real black community to speak of. Uh, and I'll explain that in, a, in another video. But this is what it is for these people. It's like it's race over everything, race over truth, race over principle, race over skill, race over talent. This is what drives the DEI uh, ideology. This is why Claudine Gay this is why, despite her incompetence and despite her unqualified resume, they thought that no matter what, we got to keep this woman as president of the most prestigious university in the nation, maybe even in the world. We got to make sure that she is the head of it because, you know, uh, diversity and inclusion. Because above all, we got to make sure black folks get ahead. No, we don't. No, we don't. Because partiality, as the Bible says, is a sin. Do not show partiality. You will not show favoritism to the poor, nor partiality to the great. If I'm not mistaken, that's Leviticus 19. So, in Stephen A. Smith's mind, Jason Whitlock telling the truth about a lying black man, i.e. Stephen A. Grift, is worse than the white supremacist. I... I it isn't clear to me. He doesn't explain why. He just he just declares it because once again, you know, mission report, uh, Hydra mind control. All he has to do is say, "I'm a black man being persecuted," and anyone who buys into that ideology just accepts it uncritically. But uh, I've got one. I got one more piece of information here because. This is not the first time Stephen A. Smith has resulted to these sort of tactics. And this is why I said Stephen A. Grift is officially his name from now on. I, that's how I'm going to uh, refer to him. Like Charlemagne the God, for example, I, I refer to him as Charlemagne the Fraud because he he does so many things that I think are disingenuous and dishonest. And many, many of these people, to be quite frank, they do this because they know they have to echo certain talking points in order to maintain their status. And, and this is the thing that I want to, and, and I think this is something that Jason Whitlock talked about a lot in his, in his, this was his point. His main point was that he was piggybacking off the Cat Williams interview and how popular it was. And the Cat Williams interview, I think, exposed something that I think is, is probably true and pr true to a certain extent. He talked about how they're industry plants and they're basically people who the people in the industry will promote and prop up because they will say the right things and they will play ball and follow the 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 ideology of 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 the people who put them in power it's it's not unlike the same thing when you see some politician controlled by their donor right the this is how you know that the person isn't up to snuff this is how you know they are mediocre is because they are easily controlled by the people who prop them up because they don't have the ability independently to ascend to the heights that they aspire to without being gifted those roles by the people who control them. So the people who control them get something and the people who have aspirations that are quite frankly beyond their talent or capability, they get something in return. So it's a symbiotic relationship. We'll promote you even though you're mediocre, even though you don't deserve based on merit to be in the role that you're in so you get all the fame and the accolades and we'll get a stooge that we can control that when we tell you what to say you say it 
We tell you to put on a dress, you put on a dress. We tell you to promote the LGBTQ propaganda, you promote the LGBTQ propaganda. We tell you to do this, you do it. It's a perfect, it's, this is why, to bring it full circle, why the left loves black women. This is why the Joy Reeds of the world exist. The Jamel Hills of the world exist. The Claudine Gays of the world exist. They don't deserve their position, but they get them because they're a plant. That's why they're there. They don't have the talent or the ability independently to hold those positions of influence. Stephen A. Smith is no ex exception. I, I personally, if I'm just keeping it 100, I, I, because I can record, I can separate the things, right? Stephen A. Smith has never been. I, I, I've never understood the appeal of Stephen A. Smith. He's never been. I don't listen to Stephen A. Smith and go, wow, that guy, he, he, he uncovered something that I would never have discovered on my own. I, I don't, I don't, there's very few, you know, I can say if I listen to Charles Barkley, every so often he'll say something like that. Uh, if I listen to, you know, there's, there's, you know, a couple analysts that might, I might say, hey, you know, that, I, I respect this person's opinion. Stephen A. Smith, regardless of the fact that I, I'm not a fan of his grifting, I just, I've never understood why people thought he was so uh, appealing. I just don't get it. But that's a separate point. Stephen A. Smith pulled this card when he tried to get Max Kellerman fired. And this, I, I really hated this because Max Kellerman was everything that Stephen A. Smith was not. Max Kellerman was smart. He was handed nothing. He's a white guy in a woke organization. So, you know, if they put him on, he had to bring something to the table that just nobody else did, right? Because they don't, you know, they don't prop up the white people, not the white men, at least. Maybe if you're a female, you, you get a quick pass until they can replace you with a black female. But that's another story. He tried this with Max Kellerman. He was taking a dump on Max Kellerman every chance he got. And Marcellus Wiley was having none of it. Marcellus Wiley said, listen, that's my guy, but you, Stephen A. Smith, you just hated the fact that, that Max Kellerman wasn't a stupid white guy that you could control and that you could outshine. He was articulate. He could hold his own, and he didn't back down from you, and he didn't, you didn't like the fact that you couldn't automatically shine in his presence, and that's why you wanted to get rid of him. That's what, that was Marcellus Wiley's take about Stephen A. Smith and him publicly going on this crusade to tell everyone how he got Max uh, Kellerman fired, which is which was the ultimate low-class, low-brow, because Max Kellerman hasn't been in the public eye since he got fired from ESPN, and he hasn't been able to defend himself. In the, well, I, th I guess he could if he wanted to, but he, he hasn't. In light of that criticism from Marcellus Wiley, this, this is Stephen A. Smith's, this is, this is his response. What Marcellus Wiley said. Now that I will direct. I will address directly. And I only have one thing to say. He and I work together. Um, got a lot of respect for him. I know the man he was talking about that was his best friend. I get all of that. No problem. Here's my only issue. For a black man to sit up there and say another black man is scared of somebody's intellect. Come on, bro. That's just the line you cross. Stephen A. Smith just needs to put, he just needs to go get a big red nose and some clown shoes and just paint his face. There again, this is his, this, that's, that's his response? As a black man, oh Lord, I just make a note of it from here on out. The next time you hear someone shielding themselves from criticism based on their race, you know right there that the person is a fraud. Claudine Gay did this almost immediately. She got up there in congressional testimony. And she said, well, uh, you know, 
I don't think it's necessarily a violation of our, you know, code code of ethics for Hamas supporters to call for the genocide of Jews. Call for the genocide of Jews and that not be a violation of the code of ethics. You plagiarized on nearly 50 occasions. Uh, th- that's not the reason why they're firing me. They're firing me because I'm a because I'm a black woman. Because they're going after me because many people who oppose me have racial animus. It's like they don't even they don't even attempt to address the substance of the criticism. They don't even attempt to address it. And this is how you know that they're grifters. Anyway, shout out to Jason Whitlock. You know, but listen, Jason Whitlock, I, he, he doesn't always have opinions that I agree with, but you can't front on this guy's journalistic chops here. He took Stephen A. Smith down with facts and logic. Stephen A. Smith, Smith Grift, sorry, I can't even get it right. Stephen A. Grift responded with ad hominem attacks and irrelevant rebuttals that even if what he said about Jason Whitlock was true, it doesn't change the fact that he's clearly apparently lying about his college basketball bona fides. And so, for that, I call Stephen A. Smith. He will forever be dubbed Stephen A. Grift. Let me know what you think, friends. Do you think this is uh, fair criticism? Do you think it's valid? Uh, I'd like to know in the comments what you think. Please like, share, and subscribe to this content if you appreciate it. Until next time, friends, God bless you.